Okay, um, one of the interesting things uh, so far this morning is that uh, all three of the uh, talks so far kind of overlap with me, which um, uh, in some ways is kind of quite comforting because I suddenly realised that maybe uh, we weren't so far out of the loop as we imagined at the time. Um, but it'll be interesting when it comes back to the discussion to maybe um, people to think about how these things fit together. So what I'm going to talk about um, is something which happened in uh, 1990, 1991. Um, this is a situation, the Museum of London uh, in 1990, believe it or not, uh, directly employed 400 archaeologists. Um, we'll come to the reasons why, if I find the right button to press. Uh, sorry, yeah, I'll just talk about the characters first. Um, uh, some of these people have changed their names, um, so um, I'll just quickly go through so everyone understands that if I jump between the two, what we're talking about. Uh, 1990, IFA is now CIFA. Uh, DUA and DOPA, Department of Urban Archaeology, Department of Greater London Archaeology, they were the uh, employees of the Museum of London, directly employed, no contract, so uh, no, uh, sorry, no uh, outside contract, directly employed. Uh, Corporation London uh, basically owns the Museum of London, um, so they're involved in this. They're basically the paymaster and the uh, legal services of the Museum of London, still are, um, so that hasn't changed. Uh, English Heritage, at the time, uh, kind of did everything. Uh, they've now split into two, so there's English Heritage now and Historic England. And I guess if this case came up today, we'd actually be talking to Historic England rather than English Heritage. But back in 1990, it was all one thing. And then finally, um, IPMS uh, was our trade union, uh, Institute of Professionals, Managers and Specialists. Uh, and they changed their name to Prospect. So uh, they're still running, uh, as I say, under, under a changed name. So filling you in on that, Oops. Yeah. Um, 1986, the government uh, deregulated financial services um, nationally, but of course the biggest impact was in the City of London. Um, what it led to was a kind of speculative uh, building boom, uh, both in the city uh, and in um, North Southwark in particular, uh, along the riverfront between London Bridge and Tower Bridge. Um, and this was one of the reasons, the number of developments that came up. At the time, we had a, a very archaeology-friendly planning service um, in London. Uh, and that was largely because it was actually run by the Museum of London. So uh, I sat across the desk from the person who was responsible for planning permissions uh, for uh, Greater London. So uh, very helpful to, to us to actually get sites when they came up and to get archaeologists on those sites. Uh, and as I said earlier, it led, uh, at the beginning of 1990, to something in the region of 400 archaeologists being employed, largely in the city and suburb, but also uh, in the uh, further reaches. Uh, there were big developments going in, uh, in and around Heathrow, for example, what we used to call the West London Gravels. Um, some of it was literally to bury London's rubbish, but I mean, other parts of it were to do with uh, a redevelopment of the airport and uh, ancillary stuff. Um, so, so this is where we came to at the um, beginning of 1990. Um, and as a result of the Big Bang, um, you've seen pictures of these earlier this morning, uh, some sites uh, came to stand out. Hugging Hill Bathhouse in the city, uh, just at the bottom of Queen Victoria Street, and the Rose Theatre uh, um, literally directly across the river uh, in suburb. Um, these sites became celebrated for many different reasons. Um, let's uh, make it clear that there was no question of our legality in being involved in these sites. Uh, there was no question about um, the developers' willingness to pay uh, for these sites. Uh, what it came down to in an end was the question of what was going to happen to these sites once the archaeology was finished. Uh, who was going to preserve them, who was going to pay for that preservation, and whether or not it actually involved um, any form of legislation to, to further protect these sites uh, once the buildings uh, went up over the top. 
Um, April 1990, <coughs> um, this was an article in The Guardian, and it kind of set the agenda. Basically, um, the Museum of London and English Heritage um, had a falling out. Um, I guess it does nothing to speak ill of the dead, but um, it, was, it was very much personality-led. I don't think, um, to be honest, that uh, English Heritage particularly wanted to have a policy or to be involved in this. Uh, the Museum of London was getting along fine. We were getting money from developers without really English Heritage being involved. Uh, we were seeing the whole process through. We weren't asking English Heritage to fund any of our post -ex. We were getting that all paid for by the developers as well. Uh, but for various reasons, uh, they decided to, to get involved. And um, I'll just show you two little highlights from this article. You may recognise some of the names here. So Geoffrey Wainwright, English Heritage Chief Archaeological Officer at the time, has said publicly that he sees the need for urgent review of all archaeological services in London. He could have said that he needed to review archaeological services for our country, or at least for England, uh, but he, he concentrated on London. A reduction in the need for expensive excavations paid for by developers, and this is a kind of crisis which occurred at the Rose Theatre. Dr Wainwright's uh, comments came at the same time that English Heritage was uh, in cooperation with the Department of Environment, uh, playing PPG-16. So, so he was a sort of a dichotomy with, with actually what, uh, what the intentions of English Heritage uh, are the same. But um, he got it into his head, and, and uh, to be honest, he, he never forgot. Uh, the other side of the argument was, was Martin Biddle. And obviously Martin Biddle had a big uh, involvement in, in the way that uh, the Museum of London set up its archaeological department. Uh, I mean, here's the report in the early 70s about, uh, you know, the future of London's past uh, was, was the main reason that uh, the Museum of London and, and particularly the Greater London Council were encouraged to fund uh, the uh, sort of core staff of, of, of the archaeological units. And uh, what Martin Biddle was saying here was, this is a, a worrying matter, the Museum of London is entirely right to be worried, others are concerned, uh, rescue, for example, uh, major erroneous decisions being made by English Heritage, they say we can get a more objective of sites from outside contractors. This is complete rubbish. Um, one of the reasons why this comment on its own um, appears to be fairly innocuous, but uh, this followed um, a decision, and, and this is where uh, IFA come into it, um, that um, we had at uh, one of the IFA AGMs a couple of years earlier, uh, a discussion about whether or not IFA should protect the regionality of archaeology, whether you know the county units, the city units, the town units that have been set up, whether that was the best way to organise archaeology, or, and uh, this was a motion that came from the uh, unit directors on the IFA council, that basically the IFA should um, not support this and should instead allow uh, units to tender against each other competitively uh, and that the market was the best way to kind of determine uh, the outcome of, of archaeological research, be it rescue or, or not. So, so even in this little uh, exchange about a completely different subject, there is a, a kind of a backstory uh, uh, of the involvement of, of, of IFA. Then we come to October 1990, uh, Building Slum Hits Archaeology. Uh, a huge development, basically London Bridge through to Tower Bridge on the south side of the river, funded by a group called St Martins, uh, better known as the Kuwaiti Investment Corporation. Um, obviously, Saddam Hussein had somewhat cut off their access to funding for projects in London. So that project, despite the fact that the museum had taken on a lot of archaeologists uh, employed in it, uh, suddenly was put on hold. The Museum of London had no work for these people and decided basically to cancel the contracts, uh, initially of 100 or so people, uh, and later um, to consider basically closing down archaeology uh, once they considered the consequences, uh, to consider closing down archaeology completely at the Museum of London. Now, 
At the time, the trade union uh, in New Zealand, London, I was the secretary. Uh, we had something like 300 members out of 400 after the staff. Um, um, I'll talk later about how we, we managed to achieve those numbers. Um, but basically, we argued from the very outset that um, what the uh, New Zealand London and the corporation, its sponsor, were planning to do uh, was against the Employment Act of uh, 1986. The reason being that they argued that if they cancelled fixed term contracts, that had no consequence on redundancy. So if you had a contract that had an end date, they could get rid of you on that end date. Our argument was that the Act of Parliament uh, covered all redundancies, whether it was fixed contract or not, and therefore we had to be given at least 90 days notice. They wanted to basically just get rid of people and say, next week your contract's up, you're out of the job. So our, our case from the very beginning was that um, we needed to convince the museum and the corporation to respect this 90 days notice. And what we hoped, of course, was that in this 90 day notice period, we would be involved in negotiations to try and ameliorate the effect of these redundancies. And that we hoped that bodies, for example, in Heritage, the corporation, and maybe even developers would step in once they realised how important archaeology was to development in London and, and save us. Uh, and basically, the museum uh, turned us down. Uh, they uh, entered into sort of very um, sort of brief discussions. They told us that uh, this was going to happen uh, and, and that's your lot. Take it or leave it. Uh, so this is uh, November 1990 now. Uh, 100 archaeologists were sacked last week. A museum was uh, planning to, to get rid of another 143 uh, on the November the 30th. Uh, so 243 people involved. Uh, it got worse to worse. Uh, at this point, uh, they still ignored the first 100, but they did enter into negotiations with us about the 143, but they still refused us our 90 days notice. Um, Yada, yada, yada. We decided the only outcome was to take them to a tribunal, which we did. Um, and eventually, uh, a year later almost, uh, September 1991, uh, the Museum Corporation of London uh, lost their case. Uh, we won, the union won. And they were ordered, basically, to pay those people uh, 90 days pay for, for the notice period that they should have, have received. Uh, it says in the Guardian 400,000, it actually turned out to be 523,000 uh, once they'd calculated all of the people in. And at that time, that was a record amount for a protective award from an industrial tribunal. So this was archaeologists actually uh, going to the top of the tree, uh, beating even miners and uh, Rolls-Royce Rolls -Royce workers uh, as, as actually getting an outcome by, by using the Employment Act to, to try and protect their, their pay and conditions. So, so that's the last slide that I'm going to show. That's just the background to this thing. Um, but what I wanted to do was to talk about how it was between uh, October, November 1990 and September 91. We, we managed to, to kind of pull off this, um, this situation of, of, of gaining this protectable war. So the first thing, as I've mentioned, we had 300 out of 400 trade union, meeting, uh, trade, trade union members. Uh, and clearly, in the lead up to these redundancies, we were unable to stop the redundancies. That has to be said. 243 people were lost their jobs. But, uh, you know, we did feel that we, we ought to carry on and, and go for this compensation figure. Um, now, the sad thing about it was, out of those 243 people that lost their jobs, um, I suspect that over 100, maybe closer to 150, never came back to archaeology after that despite the fact they received a, a, a financial reward uh, award a year later. So effectively, and some of those people had five, six years of service with the Museum of London, longer experience in archaeology as well. So we're, we're losing you know, 500, 600 person years worth of experience in, in this situation. And therefore, those of us that were left were kind of determined in some ways because of the offence that we felt that this was to us as individuals and professionals, you know, to make sure that, that we kind of hung around. Um, as I showed you in an earlier 
press cutting. The museum at London at one point were determined to actually close down all of their archaeological services. So one of the other things about us sticking around and refusing to give in was that in effect uh, we, we, we saved uh, the Museum of London's archaeology and that of course then turned into MOLAS and has now turned into MOLA uh, which you know, despite the fact that there are now more uh, units working in London, I think is still kind of quite central to, to London's archaeology. So one of the consequences of us being a little bit bloody-minded was that we still have an archaeological uh, service here today. Um, the second thing that happened about this time was that uh, quite a few of us uh, in London at that time had um, uh, constraint orders on our earnings because we refused to pay our poll tax. Um, one of our members, his mother, had actually been sent to jail in Glasgow for refusing to pay her poll tax. Um, it's quite kind of uh, enlightening how much uh, kind of feeling that you're a victim of, of, a, of a, a regime um, kind of can get people to sort of see things in a, in a bigger uh, sort of picture. And I think some of us that were feeling, you know, pretty. Um, sad that half our wages were going every month to pay a tax that we didn't believe in. We're also being told at the same time that we're going to lose our jobs over something which we knew that we actually had a case in law, that we were in the right. So that kind of, I think, instilled in the archaeologists involved a sort of a determination that, that we, we, we were being sort of um, knocked about one way and, and we were going to try and retain a little bit of our dignity by, by, by seeing this thing through on another. And then the third thing was that we had absolutely fantastic support from our trade union uh, prospect, uh, IPMS at the time. Um, not only did they get us independent legal advice, when it came to the tribunal, they actually went and got a barrister. So that uh, when we turned up on the first day, the Corporation of London sent along their lowest kind of uh, legal clerk who was just sitting there taking notes. And then our gentleman stood up and introduced himself, so and so of Temple, and all this. And you could see that kind of Corporation of London's lawyer um, sort of clinching and thinking, oh my God. To the point that at the end of the first day, um, our union received a phone call from the Corporation of London, which uh, said, Can we settle? We would like to settle. Unfortunately, they still refused to accept that the first hundred people uh, had a right to any. Uh, compensation and, and for that reason that the lawyer, our, our legal team, advised the union to carry on with the case, which I think was a, was a good thing to do. So, so and I say the, the union were absolutely fantastic and, and saw this being right the way through to the end. And I suspect at the end of the day that actually the cost to the union was far higher than maybe even the award. I mean, if you take on a barrister for a year, you're going to pay him a lot of money, etc., uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Um, so, so it's a question of basically uh, the three things together. So the workforce decide those workforce that were left deciding that yeah we were going to hang it out and, and, and try and uh, get a deal for our colleagues who've been uh, made redundant. The union uh, basically giving us great support and also the Museum of London and the corporation being cracked. Uh, that that sort of help. Um, on the wider issue. Though, um, it has to be said that you know it would have been easier if we'd had support from English Heritage. It would have been easier if we'd had support from the IFA, uh, and we got neither. Um, I wouldn't say that uh, IFA were negative, but they certainly were not uh, greatly supportive. Uh, English Heritage, as I pointed out, there was one person who had uh, an agenda, and I think that also clouded uh, negotiations for some time. And in fact, you know, a year and a half later. Uh, English Heritage were, were ready and, and happy to commit several million pounds towards the post-excavation of some of these sites which had been cancelled as a result of the redundancies. So it wasn't a question of that there wasn't money there. And of course, if that aid had been put on the table earlier, if the Museum of London had seen that there was possibly millions out there that they could count on, probably the number of archaeologists that have been lost would, would have been much, much less. So that's all I've got to say about that, and, and yeah, we can have a, a bigger discussion perhaps about um, how that fits into the big picture. Oh, Thanks. Thank you, Karen.